We use it every day, but don't think about it very much. It's everywhere in the city. It's the lifeline of the city. I'm going to talk about this enormous, ubiquitous, and pan-cultural resource in our cities, uh, about reimagining and leveraging this resource for social, cultural, political, health, and economic uh, reasons, for reimagining this place as a place for expression, interaction, survival, play, and display. I'm going to talk about the street, the urban street. Let's do a short quiz here. How many of you think that streets make up 5% of the land in our cities? Let's see a show of hands. Don't be shy. Okay. How many of you think that streets make up 15% of the land in our cities? Okay, good. Um, lastly, how many of you think streets make up 25% of the land in our cities? Wonderful. Let's find out. So this is a map of Cincinnati. I'm just going to zoom into the downtown area and the neighborhoods nearby. And what you see here in black are the parcels, private and public, on which you mostly see buildings, perhaps some parks, some plazas. And in the white thin lines are streets and some alleys, no highways. Let's collect all the black parcels into one area and the white into the other, and let's see. 42% of what you see in the white, the streets, in this part of the part of our city is just in streets, not highways, just streets. Anywhere from 25% to 50% or over 50% of land in our cities, in North American cities, is in streets. Streets are a big chunk of our cities, and streets are a big deal. Streets are the soul of our cities. Um, for a minute, let's talk about cities. The 21st century, there is a lot of interest in cities. There is wonderful research and a lot of good books that have come out that talk about how urban living is more sustainable, healthier, just, happier, and smart overall. Um, you've seen this statistic before, I'm sure, but here it is once again. Um, today, more than 50% of the world population lives in urban areas. If we look at 100 years from 1950 uh, to 2050, we are essentially on a path of being an, a rural folk to be an urban folk. We are an urban planet. Uh, this, this wonderful, um, ingenious invention that we call the city has one particular advantage and that is proximity. Proximity that gives you access and encounter. And the streets best represent this proximity, this access, and this encounter. Yet we know that all cities are not made equal. There are good cities and not so good cities, more successful cities and less successful cities. And the streets best represent this proximity and this access and encounter that allows cities to be successful. Before I came to University of Cincinnati, uh, I lived in Tampa, Florida. As, as an urbanist, I studied neighborhoods in, in Tampa. I studied streets. This is a map of um, perhaps the most urban neighborhood in Tampa. It's a, a map of Ybor City. It was built in the 1880s, and for many decades, it was the cigar capital of the world. If you look at this map, you find that uh, almost every parcel has wonderful access uh, through the, the grid of streets. Now, this is not unusual. Uh, North American streets, uh, cities were largely planned on grid patterns that looked something like this. So, while we were studying this neighborhood, we did a whole lot of mapping of the neighborhood, and I want to show you one map. Um, but before I say that, we, this is one of the most urban neighborhoods in Tampa, which is not a particularly urban place. It is a place where you can walk, where you can, in fact, find people rolling cigars. 
You can buy Cuban coffee and a Cuban sandwich off the street. There are wonderful bars around courtyards. And in fact, this is one of the neighborhoods where if you walk, you might actually find shelter from the sun and the rain, something that's pretty critical in Florida. Um, so, so we looked at this neighborhood and we uh, did a whole lot of mapping. And with this map, we just looked at the signs, the street signs that were related to vehicles. And we were astonished, we were aghast that this really, really walkable, people-friendly neighborhood where there are very, very short, narrow streets was plastered with, with signs for the vehicle everywhere. But this is not unusual. This is the story of North American cities, that they are, uh, the vehicle's hegemony sort of is everywhere uh, in our cities. In the last decades or so, uh, we've tried to address this. We've tried to address the street to not just be a place of the vehicle. And there are some wonderful examples uh, around our country where, for example, in, in New York City, there are hundreds of miles of bike lanes that have been created in the last few years. This is a, this is a wonderful move and a real good sort of change in our cities that's happening. However, it is very, very myopic. We are still looking at the single objective of mobility. We are making our streets safer, uh, perhaps more comfortable and more equitable, but really from the perspective of mobility. So we are retrofitting our streets, but we are not really reimagining our streets. We are really not thinking about our streets for their full potential. We are looking at the streets as a flattened ecology. And I'm suggesting that we look at streets and reimagine them as a real urban ecology. So a quick note on ecologies. Uh, ecologies work very, very interestingly. These are systems that allow for a whole lot of coexistence of things to happen. It's not a system that works on the survival of the fittest. It's a system that works where many, many things interact and overlap and there is, in fact, new things that are created from those unexpected overlaps and interactions. And there are many systems, some are stable, some are mature, some are unstable, some are, in fact, very, very new. Uh, and because there are so many systems, there is conflict. Conflict that, in fact, allows um, many, many new things to be created. But conflict sometimes is also to be managed, and it's managed through not by survival of the fittest, but it's managed through diffusion and distribution, both in time and space. So let's look at an example of a street, and there are many around the world, uh, like there used to be here in North American cities. This is a very short stretch of a street in India that works like an urban ecology. What you see here is everything going on. All kinds of activities take place on the street. There are people walking, driving, hanging out. It's a place to, to see and be seen. It's a place to socialize. It's a place to cook, eat, drink. It's a place to make things and mend them. It's a place to preach and pray. Um, it's a place for playing. It's a place for makeshift. It's a place for everything. It is where the workings of the neighborhood are visible. It's where the, the neighborhood ecology is visible. And most interestingly, there are systems and controls that are localized. So everything doesn't work from top-down controls that manage the street, but these are systems that work through negotiation. So there's a whole lot of system that is evolving as the needs and, and desires change. And the street works as this multiple sort of um, uh, overlapping system of many, many things together. Economic, political, social, travel, the works. So you might say, well, what does that have to do with streets in North America? Um, I'm going to show you a few examples of streets that I've studied for over a decade. Um, and I, this is part of a larger project, which was to look at, uh, to understand why do people hang out where they do in the most banal, simple way. 
So it's a scientific question, where do people hang out and why? Uh, what you see here in, the, in the, um, the black dots, each black dot is a person. And these are people in stationary, lingering social activities. These are people hanging out. These are not people moving about and going from one to the other place. Obviously, there are people in some places, and there are, peop there are, there are no pe places with no people in them. The same with another street and yet another. So while we were doing this research, we also found very interestingly that this was a place that was a place for people to gather, to meet, and to share. In fact, share kind of intimate activities and, uh, of their family. It was a place to relax. It was a place to learn about uh, social skills, learn about uh, cooperation, learn about things about the city, learn about nature, just on this very, very short stretch. These are not pictures that are coming from anywhere and everywhere. These are pictures taken at a short time in some very short stretch of the street. And this was a place to, to exchange ideas and to engage and to understand your responsibilities and your duties um, as being a sort of a, a person who engages in the civic realm. This was a place to play, even though the street was not designed as a play space. The objects were, that were on the street were used as objects for play, for children. Um, so what we found was that this very, very short stretch of the street worked as a social, economic, leisure, and political space without a whole lot of conflict. In fact, there was conflict, but it was managed, again, through distribution and diffusion. So things would take place at some times, and if there was a conflict, they would move to a different location or move to a different time. Interestingly, the number of groups that used the street was very diverse. There were people rich and poor, there were mothers with infants, and there were homeless. There were vendors selling newspapers, there were panhandlers, there were young couples, so on and so forth. And all of this existed on these very short stretch of street. And you see these territories that we tried to uh, sort of demarcate where these ecologies overlapped and where there were stronger ecologies and where there were uh, no such support of the ecologies. So you might say, well, what do we do about this? How do we create the street? How do we reimagine this as an urban ecology where all of these different activities take place? So I, I suggest looking at the street um, in three dimensions, the fixed, the floating, and fleeting. Uh, the fixed, as it might suggest, are those elements that are physical elements, and I'm not going to go into detail about that, but physical elements that are about the design of the street, but also, importantly, the composition of the businesses. So we found that independent businesses were particularly interested in this thing that we call the urban ecology that they were interested in people staying there, hanging out in multiple uh, sort of activities, and because they were vested in the, in the street itself. The next dimension is floating, which is in fact the most ambiguous and most open, and hence uh, most uncomfortable. This is composed of things that are in fact uh, things that you cannot predict, things that, will, that can easily move from one place to another place, on demand, and this is the dimension that we haven't really addressed or we are the most uncomfortable with. Finally, it's the dimension that is the fleeting dimension. This is where things come in at a time and they completely transform the street. In North America, we've done really well with the fleeting dimension, as you might know. Every city has wonderfully programmed events. And if you imagine for a minute how the street changes during those events, as you might see here, it becomes a completely different transformed space. Lots of things can overlap, lots of things are, are which you don't, don't usually find next to each other, occur next to each other. So these are the three dimensions that in, fi in fact will make the street work as an urban ecology. So if we look at the understanding of science and complexity over the last several centuries as defined by Weaver, we notice that in some of the earlier centuries, we defined the problems as problems of simplicity. We understood one problem, we thought this was the cause of it, and we went after it. At that time, interestingly, the street was a very, very complex and multidimensional, perhaps chaotic space. 
in the next century, in the 20th century, we started to understand complexity, but we were not sophisticated enough. We understood it as disorganized complexity. So we knew many things affected uh, things to happen, but we didn't really understand the fact that they were in relationship. And so we isolated things, isolated this complexity into a disorganized complexity. And in this time, the street, as a public space in the city, was really transformed into a simplistic, homogenous, and monocultural space. In the 21st century, we are very sophisticated. We now understand that complexity is actually organized. Things are interconnected, things are related, things are all systems that, one, that work with one, uh, one another, and in fact, the health of systems is, can only benefit from these relationships. So this is the time that I urge you to think about the, the street as a heterogeneous, complex, connected uh, urban ecology. I will leave you with uh, this quote, which is a part of TED, City 2.0 Wish, and I will add to it that the city is inevitable, the street is inevitable, let's embrace the street, let's embrace it as an urban ecology, as a place. Thank you.